flow. Uh, one day on the plains of Africa, a young buffalo named Walter, I don't know where they came up with the name Walter, a young buffalo named Walter approached his dad and asked him if there was anything that he should be afraid of. Only lions, my son, his dad responded. Oh, yes, I've heard about lions. If I ever see one, I'll turn and run as fast as I can, says Walter. No, said his dad. That's the worst thing you could do. Why? They are scary and they're going to try to kill me. The dad smiled and explained, Walter, if you run away, the lions will chase you and they will catch you. And when they do, they will jump on your unprotected back and bring you down. So what should I do, asked Walter. If you ever see a lion, stand your ground to show him that you're not afraid. If he doesn't move away, show him your sharp, sharp horns and stomp the ground with your hooves. If that doesn't work, move slowly toward him. And if that doesn't work, charge him and hit him with everything you've got. That's crazy. I'll be too scared to do that. What if he attacks me back, said the startled young buffalo. Look around, Walter. What do you see? Walter looked around at the rest of his herd. There were about 200 massive beasts, all armed with sharp horns and huge shoulders. If you're ever afraid, know that we are here. If you panic and run from your fears, we can't save you. But if you charge towards them, we will be right behind you. Wow. Glory to God. You know, all fear comes from Satan, and we're going to address the issue of fear today. But what a simple strategy to deal with fear from this story. What do you do when fear comes? You stand your ground to show him that you're not afraid. If he doesn't move away, show him your sharp horns. That would be the word of God and stomp the ground with your hooves. If that doesn't work, move slowly toward him. And if that doesn't work, charge him and hit him with everything you've got, like David running toward Goliath. And mostly, do not fight alone. You have others with you. The only way you can brand a cow is to get it out of the herd. As long as it's in the herd, you cannot put a brand on it. And so the cowboys of old learned how to cut in and cut out a cow to bring them over to the place where they were going to be branded. You cannot be uh, manipulated and controlled and branded by the devil unless he can cut you successfully uh, out of the body of Christ and get you into a place where you're living your life alone. Glory to God. You can be living your life alone even while you're sitting in the midst of God's people. It's not where you are physically, it's where you are mentally and spiritually. Glory to God. In Hebrews chapter 1, the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, let us fix our eyes on Yeshua, the author and perfecter of our faith. What is he talking about the fact that when we're in the battle in this world, that we are never alone. When you're at work, you're never alone. When you're when you're out engaging the world in all its ups and downs, you're never alone. What we're told is there's a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, but the question is, where are you looking? There was a great angelic army surrounding the prophet, but the servant couldn't see it, and the servant was consumed by fear and panic and drew very logical conclusions. This is it. We're done. We're done. There's two of us and there's 10,000 Syrian troops. But the prophet knew that I'm always surrounded 
by a great cloud of witnesses. I'm surrounded not only by those who've gone before, which tells us that our parents in the faith, our grandparents in the faith, the men and women who are men and women of faith can actively surround us. They're not passively in heaven watching a movie of our life but they're interceding for us, they're active, they're pulling for us, that, that we are never alone. We've got those who've gone before us. Glory to God. I believe that it, it's very likely that when we get to heaven, we'll be walking around and we'll meet some man, some woman, who says, you know, I'm so glad to see you. You, you know, I interceded for you uh, all your life. What, what do you mean you interceded for, for me all your life? Uh, you were, you know, so-and-so from the Puritan days. Yeah, I know. That's exactly what I was. I lived my life here in, on Plymouth Rock. I lived my life here in, in the outpost called Fitchburg, uh, you know. But I went home to be with the Lord, and one of my assignments was to look over the city and be assigned to people that I was to intercede for. Yeshua is the interceder. Do you think everyone else in heaven is just sitting around? And you're going to find out that you had people believing for you, pulling for you. You were never, ever, ever alone. A great cloud of witnesses. The Message Bible says all these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans who are cheering us on. There's something about being cheered on. There's something about uh, hearing the voices that get you on. I mean, you know, it, it, it's amazing how many uh, sports teams will talk about the difference when they're, when they're playing in the home stadium. Why? Because there's, the, the crowd is for them. There's a, there's, don't discount that. There's, there's a... a an emotion for that. I remember back in high school when I was on a wrestling team and, and uh, one time particularly that, that, that I'm out there and, and, and I wasn't the best of wrestlers. I could have been, but I didn't put in the energy to do that. And so a lot of times I was in a position where I needed to come from behind. <laughs> and, and so we had the cheerleaders, you know, and, and it, it was just amazing. These cheerleaders who would who would walk down the hall of the high school and, and walk by me as if I was a non-entity because they're cheerleaders and I certainly wasn't in their class of, of males that they were looking at. <laughs> you know, I mean, glory to God. I mean, let's just be honest, you know. Hey, how are you? Who are you? You know, it's like uh, they lived in their own. But when it came to that wrestling match, there are those cheerleaders. And I remember the first time that they're, they're having a cheer and they used my name, Don. I don't know what the cheer was, but it was go Don, go Don, you know. And my name, they, these girls are singing my name. Boy, that did something to me. That put an energy in me, you know. That was like, you know, oh man, I, I, I got to find another level of energy to put into this thing. And I remember one time we were in state championships and there were a couple of cheerleaders who, who went over to the cheerleaders on our team and said, what's his name? And, and, and it, his name is Don. And they started cheering for Don. Why are they cheering for me? Because they wanted me to defeat that guy so that their team could get ahead. A, a in other words, if I defeated him, their team was closer to the championship. So now they're for me. But they're not for my high school. Didn't know my name, had to find it out, and they were cheering for me. There's something about a cloud of witnesses that cheer you on. If the devil can keep you isolated, even, as I say, in church, even in a marriage, keeping you isolated, he's won most of the battle to defeating you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's not the message today. I just thought I'd flesh that out. Fear can be an overpowering emotion. In, in fact, it usually is. Fear can paralyze you from acting. Absolutely at a moment when you should act, and fear stops you uh, in your tracks. In Judges chapter 7, verse 3, you remember the story of Gideon. He's got his army of thousands of people there. But God tells him, say this, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22 thousand men left. 
Come on, you want to think, well, it's just an uncommon experience, you're a weakling, you're some kind of weirdo because you're consumed by fear. No, the fact of the matter is fear touches everybody. And the vast majority of people are controlled by the fear because we've never been taught how to handle it. Glory to God. At, at best, we've been told we shouldn't have it, but we haven't been taught how not to have it. Amen. Glory to God. And so, fear can paralyze you from acting. It's always been amazing to me uh, uh, watching nature things to see an animal like, it could be like this, this buffalo and, and his dad trying to tell him, never run. But seeing a gazelle or something trying to flee, to, flee from a lion and the lion is faster and finally catches up to the gazelle and pounces on him and I've seen the gazelle just stand there. It's like kick, fight, bite, do something, you know, kick. But what happened? At that moment, fear paralyzed that gazelle and the muscles literally could not respond. Fear can bring you to a place where you should run, but fear is so powerful, your legs do not work. They literally, biologically, your legs do not work. You, you know you should run, but fear has absolutely paralyzed you as clearly, as suddenly, and as overwhelmingly as if a paralyzing drug had been injected into you. Fear can bring you to a point of inactivity where you can't even do what it takes to save yourself. It is not to be taken lightly. Glory to God. Amen. Fear can even stop your heart. Isaiah chapter 13 verse 7, the prophet talks about the fact the day is coming when it is the day of judgment. When God is going to show in all his glory and all the skeptics of the world, all those God haters, all those who like Pharaoh said, Yahweh, I don't know of a Yahweh are going to suddenly be in the presence of Yahweh. And Isaiah writes this, the hearts of men will melt on the day of judgment. There, there are things that are so powerfully beyond your experience that no matter how strong you think you are, they have the power to stop you. I can remember, and, and we've been there many times, talking about the star-breathing God, and we go through that scenario of how big is the sun, how big is the next biggest star, and we work through the stars, and we come to a place where your mind suddenly collapses. Intellectually, you know what I'm saying, but your mind no longer can say, that's, that's great, that's awesome, that, 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 boy, I'd like to see that. It, it is so big and so overwhelming when you've got a star one star bigger than half of our universe, your mind can't comprehend that. It, it, is, it is too big. Somebody walks in the room and, you know, they're, they're seven feet. You say, you're a tall guy. <laughs> you know, when they come to eight or nine feet, you're going to say, my goodness. But if a 15-foot giant walked in the room, very few people are going to go and say, how are you? I, I need a ladder to reach your hand to shake hands with you. There, there's something fearsome about bigness. Sounds can have that. Yes. Come on. I, I can remember many times going camping and, and hearing sounds in the darkness of the night as I'm in my tent and, and, and wondering if there's a, a raccoon or, or something even bigger out there and get my flashlight and shine it and it's a chipmunk. <laughs> in the dark, sounds can sound bigger than they are. There's weird sounds going on in the heavenlies around this planet right now that are being reported uh, in calls to 911, and, and, and scientists so far have not figured out what it is. But people who report it say it's an unearthly sound. When God shofar sounded at Mount Sinai, the people didn't say, that is really great, do it again. They trembled in fear and said, Moses, you go talk to them. We're, going, we're not going to get anywhere near to something that makes a sound that big. Come on. Bigness, bigness can be intimidating. The Olympics in, in, in Beijing years ago, 
and the opening ceremony when I think it was 2,000 drummers uh, in, in, in precision, you cannot imagine. You have to see it because you can't imagine it. And they were drumming in such patterns and moving in such a way totally as one person, not a flaw anywhere. And I think it was the ABC sportscaster when, he, when that's going on who said, that is intimidating. That is intimidating. You're not looking and say, whoa, is that beautiful? But suddenly, if a people can do that, what could they do to us? Okay? Fear can be overpowering when it is dealing with things outside the realm of your experience. Fear can steal everything God has given you. Fear can steal it. You can be born again and have an exciting experience of being born again and walk with the Lord and it's exciting for the first few years and then all of a sudden the devil's got you on his radar scope and starts bringing things into your life and fear can take away the very blessings of God. People who had no financial resources but were content with God suddenly begin to prosper and then the fear of losing it comes into their life and they become paralyzed. What kind of a life is that? Let me give you a good example. In the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 3, 25, we find the answer to Job's issue that, that I wish preachers would at least read it and find out what it says. Number one, God is not the one that sent these things on, on Job. It's very clear. God doesn't tempt anyone. That's what the Bible says is, is the rule, and it was Satan that did it. And But the whole mantra in Christianity is this is God testing Job, and therefore people say, well, then he's going to test me. Listen, when you hear a, a message that God was testing Job and sent this and took this, does, does that make you want to stand your feet and run forward and say, lay it on me, God? Or somehow does that instill a fear in you? Maybe God would do that to me. Come on. Glory to God. You have to be careful of testimonies in the body of Christ where people stand up in church to supposedly talk about what God does, but they're talking about what the devil does. And in the church, people begin to get afraid. I hope God doesn't do that to me. Pastors need to shut that kind of talk down. It's bringing fear into the body of Christ. Job chapter 1 verse 5 describes the incident of, of Job in terms of relating to his children who were wild. <laughs> when a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Notice they didn't get themselves purified. Job was trying to take care, covering, you know, the errors of his children. Early in the morning, he, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them. Why don't they offer their own sacrifice? Come on. Thinking. Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Every time they had a party, every time they went out on the streets, every time they went out to do whatever they're doing, but in this case specifically, every time there were feasting going on, Job looked at his children and, and he knew that they were not following God and he feared. He feared. So he went and offered a sacrifice for them. By the way, you can't sacrifice for your children. Glory to God. We're talking about adult children here. You can't cover them. Glory to God. They, then it says, this was Job's regular custom. Say that with me, regular custom. The Hebrew there is kol yom, very simple. Kol is a word that means all uh, in, inclusive. Yom means a day or a season or a period of time. When you put coal and yom together, it means all the time. This has become a habit in your life. Well, I do such and such, I do such and such, and I do it coal yom. It, it is now habitual. The whole, all his everything, all its entirety, that's what coal means, continually through a lifetime, throughout it, Job continually was living in fear of what was going on with his children. The contemporary Jewish Bible says this is what Job did every time. 
King James says, thus did Job continually. The NIV, this was Job's regular custom. The NET, this was Job's customary practice. And the Message Bible, Job made a habit of this. A habit of allowing fear to control his life. He's always worried about what potentially is going to happen. It had nothing had happened, but he continually worried. He had no evidence of anything happening, but he worried all the time. And so when you come to Job chapter 325, Job is speaking after the calamities have come. He's lost his health, he's lost his family, he's lost his wife, he's lost uh, all, all his wealth. Everything in his life has collapsed. Job, who was extremely uh, blessed, is now a broken man who's lost everything. And this is what Job says. This is not what the theologian says, this is what Job says. Chapter 325, what I feared has come upon me and what I dreaded has happened to me. The Message Bible puts it this way. The worst of my fears has come true. What I've dreaded has most has happened. And that is the truth. The things you fear, when you fear, it draws it to you. When you speak in faith, it is drawing the the faith object to you. I believe God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When I say that faith statement, it has like a, uh, uh, an attractive beam pulling that to me. But if I turn around the next minute and say, I don't think we're going to make it, I am drawing disaster to me. Here comes the blessing but my very fear is drawing that which will consume the blessing. You must understand this. At a minimum, you've got to shut your mouth to fear. You have to. You have to. At a minimum. That's not going to get you everything you want. But the vast majority of Christians are speaking fear and you're calling it to yourself. That is scripture. Yes, it is. And if you think, well, pastor, you're tough on me. No, that which consumes you is tough on you. That which destroys your marriage, that which destroys your finances, that which destroys your health, that which destroys your occupation, that is tough on you, not me, who tells you to shut your mouth. Fear can begin to be stopped in its tracks if you just refuse to speak it. I'm very conscious when I've been in battles uh, in my life over the past 10 years or so, uh, you know, I've just become very conscious the devil's after my words. He's after my words. He wants me to decree and declare what I see or what is in the natural. And there's a force. It's a force. I've got to say it. I got to say it isn't working. I've got to say we don't have the money. I've got to, I've got to say that. And, 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 it, and it comes up there. But along with that is fear riding along with it. You don't have the money. What's that? What's that? Well, there's fear behind that. Because once you accept that, then we're not going to do this. We're not going to be able to do that. We're going to fail at this. We can't achieve whatever. The words of fear absolutely need to be stopped. And you control that. You control that. Yeshua, do you remember when he's going to heal the, the young girl who's sick and the woman with the issue of blood comes and, and distracts him and he ministers to that and then the servant comes and says to the man, don't, don't bother the master anymore, your daughter's dead. Yeshua immediately turns to him and says, don't fear. Immediately. If that man had said, oh my God, just that phrase. Christians, get that out of your vocabulary. That is profanity. That is profanity. 
oh my God is a description that something has become into your life that is overwhelming, bigger than your God. Oh my God. That is not praising God. That is admitting that what you just heard is more powerful than your God. You need to get those words out of your vocabulary. They're not funny. They're not light. They are the reason the devil can walk in people's lives. This is real. And I'm trying to change people's lives for 2019. Amen. Glory to God. The worst of my fears has come true. You, you got to deal with the fear. Because as long as it's there, my, 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 glory to God. And how do you act in fear? You know, just, just, just a, a kind of a hint. How do, you, how do you not act in fear? You're going to have to come to a place where you do the things anyway. That's right. I, I, I grew up and I was afraid of the dark. I don't know where it came from. Well, I know who brought it into my life. I don't know what circumstances in my life, you know, made walking around in the dark kind of scary and all that stuff. But, but how did it manifest? I'm an adult. If you said, well, you're, I know there's no boogeyman hiding behind the, 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 you know, the end table. I, I know there's not something under my bed. I know that. I'm a, I'm a rational adult, but I'm acting out of my fear. And so how I did it, the bedroom's upstairs and I'm downstairs and there's no light on upstairs. Well, if I turn the light on downstairs, now I'm in the dark here, but there's no light up there either. So I'm really in the dark. I would walk all the way upstairs, turn the light on upstairs, walk back downstairs and turn the light off. Well, why are you doing that? Because I didn't like the feeling I had turning the light off and walking up those dark stairs. I'm a 30-something-year-old adult acting like a, a, a little 8-year-old boy or a 2-year-old boy. You know what I mean? It's like, that's a fear of the dark. And one day I said, this is absolutely ridiculous. Powerful Christian. Going to do great things for God. <laughs> so, so I turned the light off. And man, it was uncomfortable. And I don't know, it didn't take me much, it didn't even take me a week. But, but it's like, and, and, and there's residues of that, that, that I've, I've got to make sure I've got the right motive. I am a flashlight king. Oh, yes. I, I have more flashlights, you know, than, than you can imagine. You know, I got to make sure that I'm not operating in fear with the flashlights. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Enough said about that. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14. The, the writer of Hebrews says something that I think is, is rather startling because he's writing to Christians. If this were in the world, it might be a, 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 different, a different thing altogether. He, Hebrews is a challenging book to... To read because it's very technical, it's very deep, it, 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 it's dealing with a lot of understanding of, of the Jewish laws behind uh, our life in Christ. But let's begin at verse 14 in Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from the NIV. And it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, speaking of Yeshua, shared in their humanity. Okay? We, that part we understand. So that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. How many of you know that's true? Uh, that's great. Yeshua died so, I'm, so the power of death might be broken. Verse 13. And that he might free. Oh, now wait a minute. So Yeshua died not just so you go to heaven. 15, yes. He didn't die just so you go to heaven. He died so that you'd be free from the power of death and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. He didn't come just to give you a heaven to go to. He didn't come so you just hang on for dear life through this life and then you're going to cross over someday. 
But he also came to set you free from the fear of death. And all fear is a fear of death. All fear. All fear. Had a, a young man who was working with me in, uh, in digital years ago. And uh, they were beginning to have some layoffs. And he came in one day and says, I'm really worried about the layoffs. And uh, it was the first company he worked for. I think he was probably in his mid to late 20s. And I said, so, so, you know, why, why are you so worried about it? He, you could tell. I mean, he was really, 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 you know, concerned every single day, just worried. He says, well, Donnie says, I, 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 I have a mortgage to pay. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I could get another job that quick and everything. I said, so, so what's the worst that can happen? He said, what do you mean, what's the worst that could happen? I said, you said you're afraid. You know, what, what could, what's the worst that could happen? He said, well, I couldn't pay my mortgage. I said, okay, so what's the worst that could happen? He said, what are you talking about? So you can't pay your mortgage. Well, they're going to repossess my house. Mm -hmm. So what's the worst that's going to happen? And he looked at me like, like, what do you mean? That is the worst. Your whole life you're dead when you can't pay your mortgage. I, I got news to you, there's life after bankruptcy, there's life after not paying your mortgage. You know, come on. See, see he was approaching, the big thing for him, I lose my job, I can't pay a mortgage, and probably because he had a mortgage, it was pretty hefty for, but built on his nice salary he got there, and if the nice salary goes, I can't pay my mortgage. But I said, but, so, so then what's going to happen? And see, he never thought beyond that, because losing, your life is over. Your life isn't over because you can't pay your mortgage. Mm -hmm. See, fear. He's, I, I said, so, so, uh, so are you going to live on the street? Because, see, that's what the devil said. You're gonna be, are you going to live on the street? And he thought for a moment and says, well, no, I'd have to go live with my parents. Oh, so you do have a place you could go live. You and your wife could go live with your parents for a while? Yeah. Oh, well, I guess... Uh, and, and, and then, and what's the worst that can happen then? I, I'd never find a job. That's hard to believe. Never is a long time. I don't care how bad the economy is, you can find some job. You know, but see, each, the beginning thing was, you lose your job, you can't pay your mortgage, it's over. That's a lie. That's a fear of death. And the Bible says that Yeshua came to set us free. Those of us who all our lives have been held in slavery by the fear of death. The Amplified puts it this way. That he might deliver and completely set free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their life. The basic Bible in English says let those who all their lives were in chains because of their fear of death, go free. The NIV says, set free those who are held in slavery. Note, fear is bondage, it's chains, and it's slavery. Any fear in your life, the Bible calls it bondage, it calls it slavery, come on, it calls it chains, Yeshua says, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life and have it in its fullness abundantly. When you're operating in fear, you're not living an abundant life. You are imprisoned by the enemy. Here you are, a child of the living God, and the Bible says Yeshua paid a price to set you free, but you are living in slavery. At some point, you need to get angry about that. You need to come to the point where you put your horns down and stomp your feet. And say, I am not putting up with this. Yeshua died so I can be free from this, and I am living under it, and that's the truth. You are living under it. There's no one you can point the finger to and say, they are doing it to you. They may have done it to you, but they're not doing it now. Glory to God. Fear is bondage, chains, and slavery. But here's the scary thing. Fear can operate all your life. And Christian, that is a shame. 
what an absolute shame that Yeshua, the Son of God, came, went through that cross, went through that, that terrible beating and scourging, paid a price, but in your mind it all has about you're going to go to heaven when you die, but it's doing nothing to set you free now. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. We sing it, we say it, but we don't live it. Because we're not dealing with fear. I, I, I don't know. I mean, just, just having been a pastor uh, for 50 years, it would appear to me that 99% of Christians are consumed by fear. They're, they're unable to do things because of fear. They're, they're unable to trust God because of fear. When it comes to the point where I know all my verses, I know all the, what the scripture says that are the promises of God to me, and I quote them and say them, but I'm not getting them. Why? Because I've got fear operating in my life. Come on. I remember the testimony of, I think it was Kelly Copeland, when her, her daughter was in uh, that hospital in Texas, and they said she had that meningitis that was killing children. And she comes out and her sister comes in and she looks her sister in the eye and she says, I refuse to fear. That's right. That's right. See, you need to make a decision right. to refuse it. It's not going to go away just because you quote a verse. You need to resist That's right. the devil. That's right. If you can't say the words, the battle's gone. And if you can't recognize fear as soon as it comes and start speaking where you are, taking your stand, as I said, put your, put your, <laughs> your horns down, start stomping your feet, and start moving toward that fear. Fear, I'm going to address you in the name of Yeshua. I refuse to let you come in. And you might have to say that many times a day. I remember years and years and years ago I was going through something. Man, I, I had my Bible with me all the time, even at work. Several times during the day I'd grab my Bible. and Well, I knew what the pa passage said, but I grabbed my sword and went in and read it in the men's room. <laughs> I'd get in there and, I, and I'd decree and declare what the Word of God says. Because fear, fear would rise up to, to, to take hold of me about some issue. And it's like, I refuse to fear. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to stomp the ground. I'm going to put my horns out. And I'm going to go toward the fear and address it. Glory to God. Fear is bondage. It's change. It's slavery. And if you don't do something about it, it will control your life throughout 2019. And I'd like to be, you know, the... The preacher and the bearer of positive confession and say, and for all of you, you'll have no more fear this year. I don't know that's true. If I look over your past history, you most certainly will. I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to confront you with, if you don't decide to change it, it isn't going to change. If you don't realize it's a battle and you are just tired of letting that thing control your life, if you don't take take it by the horns and, and deal with it, it's going to be there because that is the weapon the devil uses. And he only can use it because it's happening in your mind, it's not in mine. Even while I speak, your mind is controlling what you receive and don't receive. You can be hearing these words and thinking, yeah, but pastor, you don't know what I'm dealing with. See, your mind already is fighting the word of God. It's your mind. It, it, it's, it's what you're going to do with it. And again, I'd like to be the power, the, and we all decree and we all declare. I've become very keenly aware that there's a lot of decreeing and declaring going on in the body of Christ and the word of faith movement, but not enough results. Why? Because people are decreeing and declaring, but they're not doing. 
It's not the declaration you make in church. I bind fear, cast it out of my life forever. It's what you're going to do Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. It's what you're going to do when there's a conversation. It's, it's what are you going to do when the news comes on? What are you going to do when the thoughts come to your mind? What are you going to do in the night hours? If you won't fight it there, you can come every week and confess till you're blue in the face. It will not happen because a battle's not won by the declaration here. It is won by what you're doing out there. Boy, that was worth coming just for that. Amen. If you can get hold of that. Now the point is, any of you, any of us, can get hold of it and go out and make a difference. Amen. 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 Held in slavery all your lives. Come on. Bad enough to have a habit that enslaves you. <laughs> Bad enough to have an addiction that slaves you. But... But to have fear holding, and this is what the Bible says. He came to set free those who are held in slavery all their life. Which means he knows people are, he knows his children are walking in fear all their life. And when does the fear show up? When it's under attack. Come on. Glory to God. I mean, I, I've... I've Talked with missionaries who, you know, uh, bad people have come in to do bad things to them and they immediately start crying out, please don't hurt us, please don't hurt, please don't hurt us, is turning your back and trying to run from the enemy. <laughs> you take your stand, you speak the word of God. And yet, that particular missionary woman grew up in a, a church that preached the word, would have said, I believe the word, but at the moment, guess what? Fear overtook her. That fear didn't come out of the blue. That meant all the time she was there, she'd hear stories about things happening to other people and fear would come with it. Well, I hope that doesn't happen to me. Why didn't you take authority over that and say, that won't happen to me? Though a thousand fall at my side and ten thousand my other side, it will not come near me. Come on, you have got to tackle fear or it will stop you from your success in life. By the way, this works. This is an issue uh, for even in the secular world. People who have great potential and it never happens because of fear. Bill Winston this week, I, while I was working, I've been thinking about this since two weeks ago. But uh, I'm walking around the house, we had Bill Winston playing, all of a sudden he says, fear operates so faith will not produce. I thought that was a good thing. Fear operates for the purpose that faith will not produce. See, faith comes how? By hearing the Word of God. So if you're hearing the Word of God, faith is coming. Come on. He can't stop that principle. He cannot... The devil can't put, come to a place where you hear the Word and faith doesn't come. Because faith comes by hearing. That's a principle of God. Faith comes by hearing. He can't put you in a point where faith doesn't come what he can do is stop the faith from operating. Fear is the weapon that stops the faith from operating. But what a shame that we become so educated in faith, so knowledgeable about faith, but it's not operating. Well, it's not operating because of fear. Fear stops it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. In Matthew chapter 14, I, I, I want to move towards some, uh, some weapons that can be used. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. Boy, where'd the time go? My, my. I thought it was about 15 minutes. I did. I thought, okay, about 15 minutes. Are you getting anything out of this? Ma Matthew chapter 14. Uh, we're going to move to, to, to verse 25. Um, by the way, Ma Matthew chapter 14 begins with John the Baptist being beheaded. I would suggest that any time somebody's in the profession you're in gets beheaded because they're in that profession, it might give you a cause for fear of being in that profession. John the Baptist is a prophet, Yeshua is a prophet, and his cousin prophet just got beheaded. you got to know fear came. You're next, buddy. You're next. Come on. But in the midst of that, his response is to feed 5,000 people. <laughs> I 
I call that running toward the devil. <laughs> you tried to bring fear at me because my cousin got beheaded. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and do the works of God. Okay. But in verse, where did I say to turn? 1425. Shortly before dawn, Yeshua went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Now, don't judge him. You know the story. You know who he is and all that kind of stuff. But I submit to you that if you're out in Lake Winnipesaukee, a storm comes up, and all of a sudden I come walking on the water to you, that very few of you are going to say, hey, wow, it's, it's Pastor. Cool. It's so good to see you, Pastor. Come on. See, we got, see, we got to get real about life. And spiritual, oh, I would say, praise God, what a miracle. More than likely, it would terrify you because you would know you're in the presence of something totally supernatural. And you would find it a lot easier to believe it's a ghost or it's a, a manifestation of the devil looking like me rather than believe I physically am walking on the water to you. Come on. Well, that's exactly them. <laughs> They're terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out, what, in? Cried out in? They, they didn't say, hey, wow, look at that, man. That's a ghost. Have you ever seen a ghost? That is so cool. Malachi, we're, we're, we're looking at a... No, it says they cried in fear. They didn't, they didn't say, in curiosity, it's a ghost. They didn't say, as those who are aware, that there's another spiritual dimension in life, that, hey, wow, there is a spiritual manifestation taking place. Come on. They cried out in fear. It's a ghost! Say, again, I'm going back to the words I said earlier. When you say, oh my God, that is fear speaking. That is not a confession of faith. It's actually confessing that what you're seeing is more powerful than God. Hmm? When that doctor came in with that report uh, to, to Donna, when Ashley was just a little tyke and, and the, the new prognosis was bad. And, and, and by the way, it was accurate in this dimension. That was an accurate prognosis. Because all the other children put in that protocol at UMass at that time, every single one of them died within a year. That was an accurate prognosis in the natural. But when that report came, Yahweh said to Donna, she heard it in her heart, the next words out of your mouth are going to determine the end. If she had said, oh my God, that's the end. You've just decreed that that's bigger than your God. Or you can say, my God says, I will live and not die. That's right. In both sayings, you use the name of God, but do you understand that? In one saying, I said, wow, you ever seen a ghost? That is cool. Oh, man, I've, I've always thought that would be neat to see. A, yeah, and you're there, oh, cool, look at it. Or I go, oh, it's a ghost. Come on. Come on. Fear speaks. And most people are so conditioned to fear conversation, they no longer even hear it as fear. They don't know what they're saying. They, they didn't say it conscious of fear, but that's exactly what's going on. Verse 27, but Yeshua immediately, say immediately. immediately. He immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Immediately. Key number one to dealing with fear. You need to be able to deal with it immediately. And you immediately respond to fear with the word of God. Every second you allow the fear to remain in your thought, it becomes more entrenched and more difficult to get out even with the word. Achoo! 
What do people say when they sneeze? God bless you. God bless you. Even Gabriel knows that. You know, it's like as soon as, if any of us sneeze, God bless you. We say thank you. He says you're welcome. And, and then after that, he said, good manners are very important. And it's like, <laughs> you're right, they are, they are. They're very important. You can train yourself. Now, other people who aren't trained that way, they don't say anything. You sneeze and they just keep going. Okay, did they hear you sneeze? Absolutely, but it's not part of their training. But when you're trained that way, when you're really trained that way, you'll say it in places where maybe you're uncomfortable. See, some people have a divided life. When I'm around Christians, I say things, but when I'm out in the world, I don't want to say it. And, and maybe you've had the experience of being in the world and somebody sneezes and you say, oh, God bless you. And you say, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. You know, well, but why did you say it anyway? See, see, it was so well trained in you that even in an environment where you very consciously don't talk about God because it's not proper to talk about God, but it's so well trained in you that you say, oh, God bless you. By the way, if you do that, most people will say, well, thank you. Okay. But, but see, that's the training we need for fear. Immediately. I, it, it's so conditioned in the, the minute that fear speaks, you respond. Don't be afraid. So you say the words like Kelly did. I refuse fear. I, I refuse fear. I've had people say, well, I don't want to say that because I don't want to acknowledge that fear is here. <laughs> That's a lie of the devil to keep you from speaking words. The weapon of our warfare are the words you speak. Yeshua defeated the devil by saying it is written. You do not take thoughts captive with thoughts. You take captive thoughts captive with words. That's the Bible. Take every thought captive, saying, if you do not say, the thought is not captive, it is getting entrenched. And the longer you wait to say, the more entrenched it gets to the point where you can't get it out of your thinking. And eventually, if you can't get it out of your thinking, it will come out of your mouth. Glory to God. Are you, are you still with me? And, and, and so immediately, Yeshua says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. There's three things you need to know in there. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I told the Lord, listen, if you want to make this into two or three sermons, you can go ahead and do that. If you got notes, we're going to take an excursion, so forget your notes. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Three things. I've gotten 45 minutes into this message and I'm coming to three points. That's a bad scene. <laughs> no, actually, it's a good scene. It's an excellent scene. Oh, to, to get the, yeah, I know. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Notice the sequence. You would think he'd say, don't be afraid, it is I, take courage. Or, it is I, don't be afraid, take courage. But he says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. You cannot come to the third one, don't be afraid, if you haven't done the first two. Take courage is an action you need to do to Take something up or into yourself. It is I is speaking where your focus needs to be. Hebrews, fix your eyes on Yeshua. The only way you're going to go through whatever has suddenly brought fear to you is your eyes need to be fixed on Yeshua. And then thirdly, then you will not be afraid. When, when Holy Spirit just opened that up to me, I said, my, 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 I've got it backwards. <laughs> Come on. I'm trying not to be afraid by looking to Yeshua. Or I'm looking to Yeshua so I won't be afraid. When the first thing is, I've got to take something. Courage. Take courage. 
What, what is the first thing you reach to? I, I remember years ago I, when, when cassette tapes were what we learned by and everything, I had a cassette tape. I can tell you it was 088. 088 is the Kenneth Copeland Ministries tape number for a healing tape by Gloria Copeland. And so I just refer to it as 088. So in my medicine cabinet, there, there's, there's my shaving cream and there's my toothpaste and there's 088. And other people might pop open their cabinet and grab the aspirin. And I'd pop open the cabinet and I would take 088. I need 088. I, I'm going to put 088 in the cassette player, press start. You know, then I might, I don't know, take something or do something else. But the first thing I did was I took 088. Because I was absolutely convinced that 088 was medicine. Come on. Come on, come on, the book of Proverbs. The word of God is medicine. It's not like medicine, it literally is medicine. Come on. And, and so, you know, a person who has a heart condition, all of a sudden, they, they got a pain or something, and, and maybe before they do anything else, they, they grab the nitroglycerin tablet. I got to get the nitroglycerin tablet. They have faith in the nitroglycerin tablet, and, and it does whatever it's supposed to do. Great. And so they, they reach for that pill bottle, they take, but that's what they reach for first. They don't call people, they don't talk to people. You know, if they're not Christians, they certainly don't pray, okay? But they, they, they reach for, they take something. They take it. Come on. They take something. In the battle with fear, you need to take courage. Courage Courage is the force of faith. Courage is taking the word that's in you and applying it. It takes courage to do that. It takes courage when I have a choice. I can do this or I do that. I take this path. That's courage. I can go the way of the world. Everybody's stealing something in this situation. I'm not going to steal I just took courage to do that. When I took the honorable action. Hmm? I've had things at, at times spoken into my life. And the minute the word was spoken, I said, that is not true. I, I, I never, ever, ever receive a bad report, finances, health-wise, anyway. I never receive a bad report and speak the bad report. I say that's not true. Because with the bad report comes fear. It comes with it. it it's part of the package deal. You, you know, you, you usually don't even need the package deal. You know, you, you go and you have a test and then the, the doctor calls you. The phone rings and you look over and it's Dr. So-and-so's office. Fear comes with the ringing of the phone. Why, why don't you say, oh great, the doctor's finally calling me to tell me everything's okay. You ever get okay calls? I did. I had a blood test a while ago and doctor's office called and, and, and I answered the phone. Just wanted to let you know the blood test was all okay. Well, that's what I expected. So, so why would I ever assume that the phone call is going to be negative? Glory to God. But what if it is negative? With, with the negative comes, a, uh, comes fear. That's the point where you're going to make a decision. The next decision, I take the fear, or I reach over here and I take faith. I take courage. I take the word. It takes courage. You got to be courageous to do that. Come on. You got to be courageous. This isn't for wimps. Amen. Wimps aren't going to say, well, I'm going to stand on the word of God. <laughs> no, it takes courage because everything in your body or everything in your mind is is suddenly arrayed with the negative fearful thing. It takes courage to speak out your mouth the contrary message. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I remember when, when Jordan uh, was being birthed. You know, we, we, we've been through all kinds of things with children. Donna's been midwife to a lot of a lot of baby births and had her own baby births and all that. But in the midst of believing uh, for the child, she was a miracle anyway because I was told that's it, no more children. But ha 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 devil. But in the midst of it, we didn't apply faith to things that we just didn't realize we should have been. 
You know, I mean, Donna's not that big a person. <laughs> and we never thought, well, we need to be believing for a proper size baby or, or a baby that can make itself smaller rather than larger. <laughs> or, yeah, I mean, that, that wasn't on our radar scope. And, and, and so she's going through a labor that is too long. And, and, and we, we know it's too long. And, and, and so we're applying faith, but we weren't applying our faith for the right thing. At that point, we needed a creative miracle. The wound's only this big, the baby's this big, isn't going to come through that wound very easily. <laughs> okay? Had we known what was going on, then we could have prayed for a creator. Okay, body, you know, you're going to do things supernaturally that you've never done. Okay, I mean, so it could have been, but again, you can be a great faith person. Doesn't, if you don't know what you're dealing with, you, you don't know what you're dealing with. And, and so the, um, the, uh, the doctor said at one point uh, t to us, he said, well, you know, I think in another four hours, you know, we're going to have a baby here. And I'm thinking, oh, we don't want to go through another four hours of this. It's already been too many hours. No. But, you know, how could he casually say another four hours and I'm thinking differently? Because he's seeing something different than I am. The nurses and doctors were looking at Donna as if there was, how is she doing this? There's no pain at all. One of the nurses at one time, she she's, says to me, is, is she feeling this at all? Because she had no medications or anything. Is she feeling this at all? Because to them, they're used to seeing, ah, you know, whatever. You're, and, and, and that's not Donna. I said, no, she's laboring. Labor is work. What, you know, you see, is, this, is, is she feeling this? Look at her. She's sweating like a woman who's been out there working for, you know, six hours lugging weights around and all this stuff. I mean, is she, she is working like she's never worked in her life. She's working. But see, because she wasn't doing all this other stuff, they came to a conclusion. I'm looking at it and saying, she is working, and you just told me, maybe another four hours of this kind of work. And I said, well, maybe we can make some other decisions here. But, but what, what am I talking about? That, that even going through labor, you can take courage or you can take fear. And the norm in American society for childbirth is fear. That is the norm. Where do you get that norm? Because you watch movies. And in a movie, whenever there's a childbirth, they're screaming. Come on. In the old times when you certainly didn't want to even show the fact that the woman's in the room, it's in another room and the cowboy and his male friends are out there, you know, and the, the midwife's in the back room there. How do we know the birth took place? How do we know what's going back there? Because we hear screaming. I have never seen a movie movie that ever depicted a birth as I had the baby. You know, in, in Pearl Buck wrote about being in China and watching a pregnant woman working in the rice fields leave the rice field, go to the edge of the field, lay down in a patch of grass, squat down, and birth out that baby they wrap up the baby and one hour later she's back in the field working. That's right. Different culture. I'm, I'm, I'm not condemning you, uh, but what I am saying is you feed on that fear, young girl, then when you come to deliver, you've got a massive buildup of fear in your life. Start reading books already as a young woman about natural childbirth and people who, who fly. Who's going to break that tradition? Because that's all it is. Because it doesn't exist in other parts of the world. That's right. But it's passed on from mom to daughter to granddaughter and down the road. Is this making some sense to you? So you need to take courage. Take it. Wherever you can find it. Take courage. And then he says, it is I. And then finally, don't be afraid. So I've got to find something that can be courageous. I've got to start speaking 
beyond what I see now. When I say something verbally and I tell another person, God is in favor of my success, that takes courage to say that when people might say, well, where's your success? But if I can't say it now when there's no big deal, how am I going to say the word when fear is raging? Come on. You know, if, if, if you can't speak, I am healed, to your Christian friend, how are you ever going to speak it to your unchristian friend? If you can't say God's in control in, in a situation that's safe, how are you ever going to say that in the workplace or in the reality of life? And especially, here's where Christians lose it, because you get into a financial arena, the banker's talking to you, or you get into a medical arena, you're in an emergency room, you're in their world. And your words in their world are going to sound extreme. When Donna was in ICU with Ashley that time and the neurologist is there, parades in with his little entourage of neurological students. He is the head neurologist. He's the god of the kingdom there. And comes in there and starts describing, you know, Ashley's in a coma at that time and what's going on and everything like that. And Donna, every time he'd say something like, you know, and this is, this is the prognosis, Donna said, no, that won't happen. She will recover. And the first time she said it, he, he, his jaw dropped open. It's like, who, who said that? Oh, it's the mother of the girl. He says, ma'am, you just don't understand, blah, blah, blah. And Donna says, no. That, and she didn't say, well, that's your opinion. She said, no, this is the truth. That's right. He got so upset, he left the room. <laughs> With his entourage. With his entourage. It's kind of like, don't let this, girl, this woman challenge you. And, and I can't lose my cool in front of my entourage, so let's just leave. Come on. But see, you don't, you don't get that courage in that situation if in a normal situation in Market Basket, you can't speak faith. You're kidding yourself. I'm, I'm trying to help you locate yourself, so I'll do my training in Market Basket just in case I'm ever there. again. Because I've now seen, if I can't do it in Market Basket, I won't do it there. If I'm afraid to talk to the, the little old lady in line or the, the gentleman there in, in market basket, how am I ever going to have the courage to speak in the presence of intimidating people? Take courage. Take courage. Take courage. Take courage. Glory to God. And then secondly, it is I. Immediately realize who's with you. You got to realize that. Now, what's the devil do? He brings fear, takes away your courage, and wants you to focus on everything but God. Hmm? But God. Everything but God. God, God leaves the room. Okay? And therefore, you can't come to that third, don't be afraid. Now, let me, let me close with this last passage here. Don't be afraid. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. He, he doesn't say... Take courage, it is I, and fear will leave you. Fear doesn't leave. Fear is driven out. Don't be afraid is a decision you make. It's a decision you make. And if I've got to deal with it with one word, two words, ten words, a hundred words, if, like Walter the Buffalo, you know, fear didn't back off because my horns are showing, I am, I'm speaking the word, and then I'm stomping my feet, and, and fear is still coming at me, then I start moving toward it. I start addressing it specifically. I speak to it. Fear, I refuse to allow you. Or spirit of fear, I refuse to allow you to have any space in my brain. Hmm? Come on. That, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Don't be afraid means I've got to do something. And nowhere did he say, pray to your heavenly father. No, nowhere did he say, anywhere in his teaching about dealing with fear, does he say, you know, pray to God, please remove the fear. 
God's given you and I the strength to do it, the ability to do it. How? We got to use his word, have confidence in his word. But if we're weak in his word, when it comes to play the game, we haven't been practicing. Come on. Are we, are, are we on the same page? Yes. Let me... Uh, I, I got to pick up something at the end of this because next week I'm going to develop this one in, 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 uh, in, in greater detail. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love drives out fear. I don't know where I got this idea as a young Christian, probably from a sermon I heard, and probably from bunches of things about, you know, how I've got to be perfect about things. That, that when I heard perfect love drives out fear, the conclusion that I came to was this. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm afraid, I'm not perfectly loving Abba. I need to love him more. And, and so it's, it always was a verse that pointed me to what I need to do. On my part, I've got to love him more, love him more, love him more, which, by the way, gets over into works. <laughs> the thing I feared is going to go away because I'm going to love him more, which means my love is producing him to do something. Sermon for another time, but just so you think about it. God doesn't, God doesn't respond. <laughs> oh, this, this is going to, I'll just say it. God does not respond to your prayers. He's already given you what you need. That's right. God doesn't say, now that you believe, I will heal. God says, I've already healed. That's right. Now that you believe, it'll be activated. Come on, we have, we have this idea that, that our faith produce, causes God to do something. God's already done it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not because you believed. He did it before you believed. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, guess what? While you were still unbelieving, he healed you. He prospered you. All, this, all the things that God has done were done in the atonement. They're done, but we keep having this, if I do this, God will do. No, if I do this, it will unlock what God has already done. Big difference. Remind me and we'll preach about that sometime. Now, perfect love casts out all fear. There's no fear in love. Perfect love drives it out. What is the perfect love? I don't know that if I'll ever have perfect love, but he does. He perfectly loves me. And if he perfectly loves me, then if I think and concentrate on how perfect he loves me, there's no basis for fear. If he perfectly loves me, he's going to do what's best for me. He's going to take care of the situation he's got because he's perfect in his love for me. Come on. Let me give you a couple of quick illustrations. When I, was, um, when I was in high school, I think I shared this before, but I had some kind of weird form of pneumonia, bronchitis. I don't know what it was. They, they didn't know what it was. They ended up calling it atypical, whatever. Atypical means we don't know what it is. <laughs> and, but the result of it, the manifestation of it was, and, and I was, boy, I was a young Christian. I didn't know anything about faith, anything about the Bible. The manifestation was I was choking. And now, that's a pretty scary thing. You know, that you're there and you can't breathe. Every breath I took was getting shallower and shallower. To, like, in my mind, I'm, I'm one breath away from, that's my last breath. Gone, done, you know. And, uh, and so, you know, it was, it was pretty scary. It was pretty scary for my mom and dad, too. And, but they called the, the, we're in the military, they called the, the base hospital there. And our family doctor shows up. That was in the day when family doctors came with the ambulance. And, 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 and I still remember it vividly. I'm sitting on the bed. I'm holding onto my bedpost there. My, my, my knuckles are absolutely white from holding it. I'm, 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 I'm one breath in my mind from, from, that's it. I'm out of this world. And, and, and I look up, and in walks my family doctor. And the minute he walked in, there was a peace in me. I'm going to be okay. 
Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily the right thing you want to think all the time when a doctor walks in the room. I'm, you got to hear my point. My point was I had confidence in my doctor. Nothing changed. He didn't walk in the room and went, oh, thank you for coming. Boy, I can breathe now. And no. You know, it's like let go of the thing. Oh, good to see you. No. Nothing, absolutely nothing changed in the natural, but something changed in me. Fear was immediately driven out by the presence of someone I had confidence in. This is purely at the human level. I'm not talking at the spiritual, just at the human level. My confidence in him drove out the fear the minute he showed up. I'm going to be okay because the one I have confidence in is here. Purely, that, that has nothing spiritual about it in terms of the Bible. I didn't worship him as God. I didn't, you know, it's just that I, I knew it's going to be okay. Come on. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong in, in having confidence. You know, I, I've always, as, as I understood that experience, believed that as a pastor, when I walk into a hospital room, I should be bringing confidence. Come on. That, that people ought to be able to feel. A, an older gentleman in his 80s went in for surgery. First time he'd ever had surgery in his entire life. I'm a young pastor. In fact, I hadn't even finished seminary. I'm pastor in that church. And, and so I go to visit him because that's what pastors are supposed to do. And, and I'm standing there by the side of the bed and being very pastoral. How are you today? Blah, 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 blah. You know, and he's laying there in bed being very, you know, whatever you want to call him, laying there. We're, we're being two men who don't know how to relate. <coughs> Holy Spirit says to me, take hold of his hand. Now, you got to understand, this is long before I was a hugger or a hand holder. Hold hands with a guy, you got to be kidding me. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even hug people. But I heard Holy Spirit say. And by the way, I hadn't even been baptized in the Spirit. And I heard Holy Spirit say, hold his hand. And it was so clear to me, it was like, I cannot hold his hand and I know I am disobeying God. It was that clear. So I reached out and took his hand. And when I took his hand, man, he grabbed my hand and then put his other hand and now my hand's in the middle of two and he's holding onto that hand. And I realized, he's afraid. He's afraid. You know, I said, so I, 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 I said, Stan, I said, so let, let's pray. And I remember praying specifically about fear. There's nothing to fear because God's in control. What did I do? I spoke the word and brought God into the picture right away. Standing at that bed, God shows up. Standing at that bed, we're speaking faith. And, and as I'm praying, I could feel his hands relax. What's going on? Things are changing because a man he had confidence in showed up began to speak the word, put God in the scene, and, and, now, and by the way, everything was fine for him. I mean, he lived another, I forget how many, dozens of years. But, but, uh, but, but the point of the story is that, that somebody shows up. The devil wants to make sure that when you're at a point of fear, nobody shows up. Hmm? That's what he wants to make sure. The only way he's working on fear in, in your life is when you're isolated. Hmm? By yourself in your own thoughts. Don't be alone. Don't be alone. Come on, even Alcoholics Anonymous knows that when that uh, alcoholic demon tempts you to, and that urge creates in you, you I got to have a drink, I got to have a drink. AA teaches, call your buddy. Not your drinking buddy, your AA buddy. <laughs> John, John, you. you, you you got to help me. I, 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 I just, I, I just, I, I need to have a drink. I'm going to go down to the bar and I'm going to get a drink. But I made a commitment to you. I would never do that without calling you. So I'm calling you. And when you call, he's calling with the intention. I'm going to tell you because that's my obligation to you. But I'm going to go have that drink. But the point is now I'm in touch with somebody. Now there's two of us fighting the same alcoholic demon. Come on. 
You need to make a commitment to quit trying to fight fear on your own as if you're some kind of spiritual giant, the one and only human being who needs no others. You need someone to come into your life. You need someone to come alongside. Someone you can pick up the phone and say, look, I don't need a lot of words and everything like that. Just tell me everything's going to be okay. You don't need, I don't even need to tell you the situation. Just tell me it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I'm in agreement with you. Fine, thank you. You know, I don't need to tell you the details. Why? Because when I'm telling you the details, I'm trying to get you to say, if you really knew how bad it was, then you would sympathize with me. And really what I want is your sympathy. But what you need is the word that puts you in another place. And it needs to be a voice or a person. In my case at 18, it was a doctor who had confidence just walking in, brought it with him. Come on. There's been times in my life when it's been my pastor. And what my pastor says to me, sets me, all I need to know is my pastor's in my corner. That pastor Jonathan set me free in a tremendous way by, by sending me a card and all it.